On a planet, no hope of survival. But you're also not sitting next to Phil anymore in that cubicle, so... Win? Oh. You never get a second chance at a first impression, so they say. Now, in many aspects of Metroid Prime, this is very true. The characters you meet, the format you play first, and even the game production itself. And out way back in 2017 by Nintendo, Retro Studios had to step in and salvage the original plan from Bandai Namco in 2019, three years into development. And it took them a further six years to complete the Switch game. So long, in fact, they could squeeze in a Switch remaster, which this entire game engine is built on and helped fund, but also upport it to Switch 2, and that is what we are discussing today. Now, as noted, Retro used the GameCube port with Iron Galaxy for the building blocks of this Switch title. I covered this over on IGN. The engine itself delivers crisp, largely AA-less 900p 60fps visuals in that remaster. Here, though, it takes a 10% haircut on that across both axes for Prime 4. Now hitting a fixed 1440 x 810 in all my counts within a 900p output container in docked mode, including the hood and 2D visor. The handheld mode drops this down to 720p output now from a 960x540p base. Very retro indeed. The benefit is it all runs at 60fps in both modes on this almost retro handheld itself, which actually is impressive but also not uncommon on the Switch hardware and certainly from Nintendo's aims throughout its life. The Game Boy was famous for the fact that it ran games at 60fps more often than not. Switch 2 improves on those numbers and modes. It has much, much crisper visuals and it has two modes rather than a fixed one. Much higher assets, details and clarity owing most of all to the 12GB of extra VRAM it has versus the 5GB total on Switch, of which only 3.2GB is available to the game versus approximately 9GB for Switch 2 here. And three times the RAM means we get vastly higher details, normal maps and quality irrespective of the output resolution, which is higher in both of those modes. Quality and performance. The quality targets 60 FPS just like the base switch does, but it runs it at 4K, or at least a 4K hood and output, from an approximate 1440p base. Now this doesn't use any form of TAA, and it actually looks like SMAA. And in fact, it is SMAA because it's in the credits of the game itself. One of the restrictions of the code itself, because it's MIT license, means you have to state what you are using in the game. And this was created by Jorge Jimenez, an excellent and relatively relatively cheap morphological AA that cleans up shimmer and sub-pixel jitter on edges and high contrast areas without smearing or blurring the image itself, textures and ghosting with halos which TAA can often cause, meaning we get a far superior image resolve in both the docked 4K or 1080p handheld mode at 60fps and then the performance mode drops that down to 1080p at 120fps with the handheld mode slashing this further with a flat 720p output now, matching the OG Switch with a 55% reduction on fill rate to hit that 8 millisecond frame time. And this is one of just two games since I bought my Switch 2 at launch that has a true 120Hz mode to test, and it does highlight some issues within the screen itself, which I'll get to a little later in the performance section. So, comparing both generations of Switch and the dual modes on Switch 2, we can see that going from dock to handheld mode has a similar level of impact, within 12% of each other at 60fps, but the 120Hz mode on Switch 2 costs the same in pixel pushing and bandwidth reductions as the 2016 model, some 55% less. However, due to the much smaller screen, the change is almost imperceptible. Now settings do not change between modes and even between Switch 1 and 2, the install size is around 2.1 gigabytes higher for the Switch 2 version, which is likely all the textures in the game, which are authored at a much higher quality and resolution, which along with them occupying more VRAM means we see almost all the visual changes coming from this main area. 
Resolution increase does help, mostly in texture filtering, with the increases on quality being slightly better than performance mode, but both drastically are better than the trilinear of Switch 1. But the game's art and visual makeup mean this is less impactful than asset quality alone. Shadows are the same, level of detail levels, character models, animation, and even enemy counts and attack patterns. Real-time cutscenes and gameplay all line up and look like a remaster of yesteryear, or more apt, changing settings from low to medium on PC. Outside of this though, the increased fluidity and 120Hz mode are the other big wins for Switch 2. Well, aside loading. Now this is where the much faster I.O. of the Switch 2, the CPU and the RAM, along with some dedicated hardware to depack the data from the cart or drive, means we see huge gains in loading. Main menu to the same load at the first real mission, Switch 2 does it in just under 30 seconds, which is not lightning fast, but much faster than the old Switch. Which takes over a minute to the exact same load, over two times faster loading increase over the old handheld, which adds up in the game the more you play. The loading within each segmented level is almost zero now, even on Switch, and they have greatly improved the data streaming and access now in their engine over the remaster. Lifts, opening doors, and changing into the morph ball and back are all much faster. However, the game is not free from loading. They are often hidden by Metroid versions of the subway ride in Spider-Man. Jump into a cargo shuttle, treat it to a flying escape pod as it loads. Enter a new level from the open world, loading on a cargo ship. Leaving a level and going back, the same. Even getting your bike and leaving the fusion level is a moody bike ride admiring Samus's Alpine Star boots, Arai helmets, and Dionysi leather gear. They are much longer on Switch 1, upwards of 40 seconds to over a minute at worst, but Switch 2 can see these take upwards of 20 to 25 seconds on average. They are, however, faster in the performance mode than in the quality mode due to that 120Hz V-Sync, which helps everything, specifically its tick rate and game logic. So if you want the fastest performance and loading, then performance mode is the way to go. The 120Hz mode on Switch 2 is a great option, with it being the best way to use the mouse option support with that Switch controller used in both hands, but I still prefer the old school controller. Now as far as overall game performance goes, unsurprisingly, it hands in a stable and smooth 60fps on Switch 1 with open sand map levels, combat sections, and even the most stressful Vault Forge level, sticking close to that 16 millisecond frame times. It can have a drop frame here or there, one or two in some odd spots, but I feel most of those are just general code, data, memory related issues rather than any pure GPU or CPU impacts. And this is even better on the Switch 2's quality mode, which is by and large locked to that rate in all sections with no issues at all. True in both docked and handheld mode on the OG and newer Switch console. So really, not much to talk about here. Turn it on or play it on Switch 1 and get a locked 60 FPS. And the same is true of the 120Hz performance mode, where, try as I might, I could only find a single frame drop in combat. Motorbiking and puzzle solving, even the real-time cutscenes, present no issues at all. And this is again true, based on limited tests in the handheld mode. However, this brings us to the LCD elephant in the room and response times of the Switch LCD screen. Now in my test, using Metroid's 120Hz mode, I found that response times, that is the time it takes for the pixels on screen to fully transition from on or off, red to blue, etc., is on average around 41 milliseconds, which is not good for a screen designed for HDR and 120Hz output, to put it mildly. As you can see here in my 120 and 240 FPS capture, we can see excessive ghosting of the image, which causes blurring in motion. Also frame persistence on high contrast changes as sudden shifts can take four to six frames at 120 Hertz to fully transition. And in action and constant motion, the result is an image that can look blurry and noisier than that same output does on a docked 4K 120 Hertz screen, such as my OLED LG or Samsung 4K panel. Now compounding this, is the panel also lacks the sufficient brightness and pixel isolation to present anything close to the HDR quality the game can deliver whilst docked. Specifically since Nintendo have now updated the OS HDR config tool to be, well, working incorrect now. And this is only compounded by the ghosting persistence issues just noted. Now that said, the 120Hz mode is noticeably better in handheld mode than the 60Hz one and the drop to 720p makes little difference and thus is my preferred way to play on the move and whilst docked. 
the significant pixel increase in quality mode is not as impactful as the increased refresh and input latency times, with the OG switch matching the Switch 2 identically for a 100.17 millisecond input median latency in the single and quality 60fps mode respectively, whereas the 120Hz increases this by over 41% to 58.5 milliseconds median which feels significantly better, and this carries over to dock mode also, but your screen of choice will have an impact on those results. Metroid Prime 4 has been a long time coming, and it has clearly been a reboot of epic proportions in that time to take nigh on eight years to launch, the visual results and performance on both Switch and Switch 2 are very, very impressive and continue the Nintendo trend of quality control and smooth 60fps or die gameplay. Visually, it's also a good looking game with clear artistic influences from many areas. HR Giga, Vault Forge and Ice Levels being a mix of Alien meets Journey to the Centre of the Earth with a Maximilian style sentry droid from the Black Hole, Audrey 2 boss battles, and a cool but underused Akira cyber cycle mechanic for Samus, and very big flashes of Arkham Knight intentions within. The gameplay is very safe and feels similar to previous Prime games. Explore the world, unlock doors with powers, find the MacGuffin, fight some baddies, power up, rinse and repeat. And on that score, it is pedestrian and never offers much surprise, although some levels and sections are better than others. The open sandbox that connects each level past the second is largely pointless and barren, with little within it to occupy your interest, but it does add time to the game, which I feel is the only reason it's here with reviews focusing so heavily on how many hours to complete, skewing developers to make these kinds of decisions when they simply do not work. And it is not an open world at all, just a Mad Max style desert to extend level X to level Y in those all important engagement minutes and metrics. If you find anything else, bring it in to me. I'm dying to do more experiments. Sound is good, but the music can grate and I never noticed any great tunes or rousing score during any sections within the game. The game's art though is the best part, with great use of specular lighting, diffuse materials, shadows and colour, along with light bloom and all pre-baked to look exceptional on the 10 year old Switch 1 hardware. But as a Switch 2 title, it is far less impressive. Aside the 120Hz mode, which is a simple feat with identical settings as Switch, just at 1080p rather than 810p at twice the frame rate. It certainly looks cleaner, sharper, more stable, but it still has its own issues of shimmer on edges, AA specular, poor low quality textures, and lo-fi look in many areas. And as such, if you play on Switch 2 first, then move to the Switch, it flatters the Switch 2 due to the lower asset quality filtering and details. But the other way around, it simply looks like you bumped up the res and quality mode, and that's exactly what you get, because that's what they did. I enjoyed the game in places, but forced myself to finish it after the third map to see the end, and I was not surprised when I did. I think as a swan song for the Switch 1, it is a very good looking, artistically driven, high performing game. The HDR is excellent, largely due to the high contrast art and use of shadow and lights throughout, yet equally shows the shortcomings of that Switch 2 screen in output quality, response times, which the inevitable OLED model should address. But as a Switch 2 title, it's quite mundane and resembles a cross-gen update patch rather than a new Metroid title fitting of the new hardware it occupies. Anyway, that's it for all things gaming, technology and handheld related. Remember, if you like what I do here, I am completely self-funded and independent and you can help me by subscribing, clicking the link down below and put support to me on Patreon, giving me a thumbs up if you liked the video, a thumbs down if you didn't, but either or, give me a comment to tell me what you liked about this or anything else that I've put together. Be sure to check out my channel for other videos and my website for more information on this and other games. And I'll see you very soon on the next one.